Are you listening? Are you out there? This is Tim Laskus. You're listening to the Tim Laskus Show, episode 20. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that's 20 to zero. Man, I am rolling through these episodes. And my featured guest today is Sasha Lago. And Sasha has 15 years experience in the commercial and spiritual realm working with private and corporate clients. She's a speaker, a frequent guest on all kinds of radio talk shows on AM, FM, you name it. She's been on it online and she has an MBA and she specializes in organizational and human behavior. And I like that because I have a background in organizational behavior too. So we got along great. But anyway, she is also a host of various shows such as Sasha Talks Spirituality, Awaken with Sasha, Sasha Talks, and I think her newest one or the one she talks about the most is Moving Mountains with Sasha. And this is episode is Sasha Talks to Tim. How you like that? Yeah. So be sure to listen up and get ready. Enjoy. The Tim Lasker Show in search of entrepreneurial gold. Tim digs deep into the minds of his guests, entertaining, down to earth, and informative. Now, here's your host, Tim Laskus. Today's featured guest is Sasha Lago. Sasha, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Tim. And I was so nervous saying your last name, but I, I think I got it correct. Lago, right? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, I've had a lot of Starbucks coffee today, so um, I'm, I'm worried. I'm ready to go. You were telling me earlier that, that your passion, aside from business, is art. And I want you to tell the listeners a little bit about your experience, your history, and, and background in art. But before you say that, I'm the first to admit that I can screw up a stick figure pretty good. I, that's about as, I mean, I am as far from being artistic as possible. So it's good to have you on so you can talk about you know, what, what it really is to be like a, you know, a professional as an artist. Are you sure? Well, I love art. And when I started out from a young age, it was just to draw and paint and just enjoy a kid being a kid. And I felt that every time there were any challenges or a distraction that I needed, I would just resort to drawing. And for some reason, since childhood, I've had this fascination with drawing eyes. Without me even realizing it, this habit carried with me into college where I would be sitting in lectures and drawing on my book covers. And the fascination with eyes and uh, facial features, uh, drawing nature and painting, that during my elementary school years, I used to participated in extracurricular activities for art clubs and painting. And then at one point, by the time I was in high school, I was nominated to be running art club. And there you get to collaborate with uh, other types of talents because art isn't only about drawing, painting, but really talented people come together and then you would draw a mural or collaborate with the town mayor for events and display your artwork. And at one point, without me even realizing it, I was nominated for my art uh, within the town. And then because I went to public school Monday to Friday, on Sundays, I was a good girl and went to Sunday school. And at Sunday school, they also incorporated art in their classes that every year I would compete in those competitions and I would win. And after three to five years of coming in number one, I got a little bit tired of my own uh, ranking that I started exploring other types of art, such as calligraphy in foreign languages. And uh, I continued that a little bit into college, but my focus was business. So I kind of laid off it, but it's still a part of my life. Yeah, for sure. And, and you'd mentioned being able to draw eyes. It, it seems like being able to draw someone's eyes, which I guess are the window to the soul, must be the most difficult part, I would imagine. No? Am I wrong? Well, I would draw them, and one of the guys in high school would tease me, and he would say, Sasha, they all look the same. And I'm like, it depends how you look at a person. Eyes never lie. Mm. That's how I look mm -hmm. at it. That even without a person talking, there's something about a person's eyes that capture my attention. 
Wow. Well, the last figure that I drew with eyes, I had one eye going to the right and one going to the left. What does that say about me? <laughs> You're even more creative than I am. <laughs> that was a nice way of putting it. I was uh, I was waiting for you to go, you suck. Just, just quit drawing. <laughs> Well, speaking of, of being a professional as far as, as uh, art goes, um, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself professionally in business and what are you currently working on? Yes, I started out, well, I have two degrees in business that focus in management operations, but because when you go to business school, you're introduced to different facets of business. So when you graduate, you are equipped if you did your part in college and met your professors halfway to know how to come up with business plans. What do they mean? How do you run a business? And it's not only about an idea and knowing the right people, but you have to be self-sufficient. So I specialize in management and I love organizational behavior and leadership because we work with people and for people. And the part that fascinates me is I want to know what makes another human being tick. What motivates what motivates them? What brings out the best in them? What do they not like to do? Because when you're running a business, it's like putting a puzzle piece together. You want to bring, you want to take people's best talent and match it up with the right role that they could possibly work. You're not there to tell them what they should be doing with their life, but you want to give them options. And I like watching people grow and develop into who they can be to actualize their potential. But what I'm working on at the moment, I need to do a little bit more public speaking for one of the books that I just wrote, Cashing Karma. And I'm also welcoming guests, interviewing them at the process, uh, at the moment for Moving Mountains with Sasha. And at the same time, I am out there building a portfolio for speaking engagement. Wow, you, you're pretty busy. And with your specialization in, in management, I think people have a wrong idea about what it means to to manage. I think they, they people as people are promoted, they think, okay, well, I'm a manager, so I need to manage people. So I need to tell people what to do. And that often isn't what really works. And they find out pretty quickly that people don't like being told what to do. What do you recommend? I was thinking about this last night regarding our upcoming conversation. I feel that some managers manage people as they manage things, which is not a good thing because people are dynamic. They have a mindset. They have emotions. And some people are really straightforward and they come from the olden age of this is how things were done and this is how I'm going to do them. And managers stop growing and keeping up with the times. It doesn't mean you give your direct reports what they want, but you have to be uh, present in the moment and connect with people. And then there are managers who are more so inspirational leaders who know how to work with people and bring out the best in them. And if you know how to tap into each person's talent and appreciate them, they're going to end up producing more work of better quality over a period of time. And not all leaders can be managers and not a uh, majority of managers that I've seen cannot be leaders. Mm, well said. And, you know, helping people with, with talents and to identify those. And it, a lot of it goes back to building people up. The, some of the, the best leaders and managers and supervisors out there know how to build up the people around them and not tear them down. So many people have, who, who are poor managers, poor leaders, poor supervisors, they, they tear people down and they're quick to, to point out the shortfalls and, and they just have it so wrong and they run into difficulty pretty quickly, right? I would say from what I've seen, yes. Usually there is personality management issues or personality clashes. Some people don't know how to communicate effectively. They might be able to communicate that way at home and earn the respect of their loved ones, but you cannot speak however you feel like it and earn the respect of people who don't know you, but you have to work with them. I feel at times I've seen managers abuse power They've been managers who were promoted into being a manager and they had no experience of knowing how to 
uh, collaborate with people. Because if you've worked a really specialized position in your life, let's say out of a cubicle or you're an analyst and not to stereotype or generalize anybody out there, and all of a sudden you get promoted into a position where you haven't been given the resources and nurture to know how to go about that transition, then there is a chance that this individual may fail in that role. And some managers set up people to fail in given roles because they don't know how to do their own job well. Mm. And you have a great understanding of not only human behavior, but behavior within organizations. But you also have an understanding of spirituality and how it fits in professionally. Can you talk a little bit about that? Typically, when people learn that I also spend time in the corporate world, I often laugh at their reaction or the response because to, uh, usually I hear of people in the corporate world don't have a soul, they don't care, they're all about the money, and they have that dark side or that dark perception of what corporate can be. Yes, I will say corporate is a little bit of a different type of creature. You have to learn how to navigate through the game. It doesn't mean you have to compromise who you are or compromise your values. There are very few people that I've met who are exceptional leaders out there from Fortune 500 companies and other companies out there who know and understand what power means, what management means, and how to coexist with people. Now, with spirituality, when I talk about spirituality in the business world, I'm not talking about uh, rely on psychics and the rest of your life will be taken care of. It's more about being grounded, acquiring a mindset where you know and you could uh, tap into your own energy. You're not always looking outside for answers for other people to validate you because there are going to be moments in life, even out of your workplace, where you need to have that inner knowledge which most of us have, and listen to your gut feeling and your intuition of how you should navigate through uh, relationships, decisions. There are times where we know that something doesn't feel right, but we still go forth with it because our mind, our heart, and our gut are not in alignment. And people who are more grounded and have a more overall better understanding of who they are in their life, they perform better regardless of what occupation they work. Wow, I, I love that. And it's spirituality is, is so important. And again, just to reiterate, we're not talking about tarot cards. So Sasha is not reaching into her bag and pulling out tarot cards and, and doing a reading. I don't know, maybe you, you, you know, that. do you know anything about that? I don't know anything about tarot. I'm familiar with tarot, but when I do spiritual counseling. Tarot. See, that shows how much I know. I, I, I used to I call it tarot so we won't go into that <laughs> because while growing up i've always done readings without using tools because that's the world that i knew and thought that's how you do it i always thought other children were like me and as i embraced adulthood i thought other adults are like me but then i re learned that no there are things i see and hear or information that comes from within me which is clear cognizance inner knowing I go based off that. Now, and then I will confess there are business people who come to me for those type of readings, but I always make it clear that that realm is not scientifically driven. It falls under the entertainment realm, so we have to keep reality in check. And then the business coaching aspect of it that I offer is, um, for the most part, independent of that spiritual counseling that I do. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. and, and you do so much between your coaching with individuals and coaching with organizations. I mean, you're a host of, of about 200 different shows, I believe. Um, you're writing books. I mean, you're doing it all, Sasha. What would be some tips that you have for our listeners who are entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs out there on how to be successful? Well, for entrepreneurs already out there, they have a, they're acquiring an idea of what the reality is when you work for yourself and you're proud of not having a boss, but you have to be disciplined and make and a, apply your sound judgment in order to uh, succeed day to day because you have to be consistent in your progress and your performance to be out there in the long term. Now, for those who want to be entrepreneurs, and those are a few people that I've been talking to in the past few months, and I'm always reminding them that I know you want to run out with your hair on fire wherever you're working, but you have to remember that the idea of working for yourself is great, 
but are you ready to put in the work, the energy, the good times, the bad times? And you have to produce your own income, so you have to be plugging away until you find the method that provides consistency and you're not going to run back into if you're working corporate or run back to that odd job or rod, uh, run back to a family business because you're not going to give it enough time. That is one thing that people overlook that they're going to find overnight success because they're doing business with a friend and we have this great idea. There are many great ideas out there, but unfortunately the market isn't receptive to a good portion of them because there has to be a need of what you're offering it might be a good idea but you might be doing it because you have all the resources and i don't like to use the word fail but you could just say okay well i started a business and it didn't work out but i gave it a try are you going to try it or are you really going to invest in yourself mm. you know i'm on Instagram. I don't know if you're on Instagram, uh, but Instagram is full of these photos of mega yachts and Lamborghinis and Ferraris and <laughs> 25,000 square foot mansions. And people are just eating that up. They're clicking away. They're like, yeah, I love it. I love it. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to live that lifestyle. I want to land my helicopter on top of my house and take the elevator down to my kitchen you know i want to live that lifestyle and people kind of get caught up into that fantasy because that's not the reality at least in the beginning for most people right because i agree because they're looking at the outcome of all of the hard work and whether and people will always have opinions of whether someone is worth that much money or not and how come this person gets paid more but typically the ones who are posing these opinions and shots that they take at people, they're not the ones out there in the field making things happen. Yeah. Would you say that people who are lazy employees probably will not be a good entrepreneur or at least not successful? That ties into another thought I had last night because I was thinking about uh, entrepreneurship and the type of people who want to break out of the nine to five rut. Well, this is an overgeneralization. I will admit to that. But I've noticed that there are two types of mindsets, if I had to narrow it down for simplicity's sake. One is there are people who are really disciplined and they do well with making their own decisions and they're not looking for constant validation and direction that they could figure it out. And then there are there's that other group of people where I feel they're just meant to report to somebody, work for somebody else because they need that structure, that guidance. and. Some people respond better to a third party than respond to themselves or someone that they know. Because when I started out with the coaching during my teenage years, I was an academic coach and I would coach uh, ch child actors who did Broadway in New York City and some local students that came to referrals. And I was brought in because the parents would tell me that their children respond better to a third party than taking those that they know for granted. And some people need that type of discipline, even as adults. And then there are some people who do a 180 and they have that shift in their mindset that I don't want to work for anybody. I want to help myself. Right. And so it, it doesn't mean that they'll never be an entrepreneur, right. but you talked about having that shift and there needs to, to be a shift in their mindset about their ability to go out and perform and to manage their own time and to manage their own work and responsibilities instead of having other people manage them. And so, you know, somebody who is lazy now could all of a sudden decide tomorrow when, when they're ready that, okay, I've had enough of this. It's time for me to take control of my life and to do something. I agree. Nobody is a write-off. It just comes down to when are you ready? When do you get tired of your own behavior or your own lifestyle that you want a different outcome? And you can't keep on doing what you've been doing and expect something different to occur. Mm -hmm, for sure. Now, when did you realize that, that you wanted to, to be an entrepreneur? Or when did you decide you know, this is the path for me. Were, were you very young or, or were you a little bit you know, older in life? 
Well, when I left college, or by the time I even got my master's, I didn't think of entrepreneurship at that moment in time, but I was engaging in a pattern that I picked up really early on in my 20s was that, yes, I had great education, I had a great performance record, but I would take on new opportunities. I would outgrow them in really short periods of time, meaning from six months to a year, and then I would move on to another opportunity. And at one point, it wasn't even about the money. I just felt as, okay, what am I doing wrong? Am I not applying for the right jobs or are people hiring me knowing that I'm overqualified and that I'm going to leave? And that kind of continued for a while. And then I said, and what type of skill set do I have that I haven't capitalized upon? And I really had to think long and hard about it. And it had to do with the spiritual counseling aspect of it. So when Sasha Talks came out, it was strictly for the spiritual aspect. Those services were provided while I was doing contracting work. And it got to a point where I, I endured a few f financial hardships that I told myself that you can't always rely on third parties to dictate your paycheck. What do you do when the economy is bad and then they have salary freezes and they're not giving out bonuses? What if you have a good manager, but they can't afford you or the budgets are leaning up? Usually the people who are the most qualified or come out of overhead, I typically happen to be one of them from past experiences, they get the cut. So you have to create your own parachute even for a bad day. So Sasha Talks was derived from a place where I needed new forms of income. And at that time, I didn't know that I would be talking to you years <laughs> down the road, but it has sustained itself because I put in a lot of blood, sweat and tears in it and I've allowed it to evolve. So the growth strategy for Sasha Talks has been long-term. It wasn't only about uh, make all the money you want and then leave the market. Mm. So it sounds like you, your real shift was, was in pain. Yes, a lot of pain and maybe stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> but you learned from it. You, you, it. It was a life lesson. And, you know, our journey through life is full of lessons, and, and that's what makes us who we are today. And uh, as, as long as we're open to learning, I'm sure you would agree that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just don't keep making the same mistakes over and over. Right. I just got tired of that pattern, and I said, I cannot imagine me working that way for the next 20 years where I'm going to take on an opportunity. And then in 18 months, I've mentally and emotionally outgrown it something is not right and that's where you when you get tired you make changes or when you can no longer endure the pain that you're in you're going to hopefully make a positive change yeah embrace that pain recognize it and figure out what's going on and let that catapult you to success it's almost like fuel you know the pain can be a fuel that can burn you down or you can use it to propel you in your jet engine to actually do something and create something in life. And what are some great ways for individuals to bark, embark on their own entrepreneurial dreams? Well, I would encourage them to do a lot of reading, read books, talk to people from the industry that they want to enter, uh, be inspired, but don't do all of the thinking and the planning, but make sure you have the actions behind it. because. There are times where I hear people talking about these great plans and I know this person and this is how I want to go about it, but they don't talk about what are they going to do. They don't have a proper execution strategy in place, but they have a lot of thoughts in their mind. Right. And, and as far as having a strategy and, and really a strategy with, with money is, is a big issue um, when it comes to being able to earn money, to save money, to, to make your money grow. Did did you get a, a, a lesson early on in life about money and finances, or how did you learn about that? Well, I have parents who come from the times of the 40s, so they were one of several children on both sides of the family. And for them, the concept of sharing and understanding the value of money and how to stretch a dollar and make it go a long way, I admire that in them. At some point, I did not acquire that education, even though as a kid, I worked for my allowance and 
started working as early as the age of 12 or 13 for money, I feel that a lot of my money uh, education has come through life experiences and knowing not to rely on third parties to give you any, uh, I wish, I would say guidance or decisions. Uh, do not outsource any financial decisions when things are under your name. On a personal standpoint, when people talk about their money challenges, I tell them you're talking to a recovering bankrupt from years ago. And when you have lost everything and then you rebuild yourself, you have a brand new perspective. And I think the bankruptcy was one of the best things that ever happened to me, even though I was not one of those people who traveled the world and just went nuts with money. I didn't even know that I had credit lines of six figures at such a young age until I started receiving letters from the court and I realized, okay, if I'm not charging these things, who's doing it? And that's when I found out that there was a third party that had compromised information and taken advantage of those credit lines and all, but it was a little bit too late because I had tried settling it through a private group and I found out it turned out to be a fraud. So. Take matters into your own hand and don't let anybody convince you of what you should do with your money unless you're willing to deal with the ramifications. Yeah, well, that's great advice. And going through a financial hardship is is, is must have been very difficult and it's unique for everyone in, in their experience. And I'm sure there's probably some listeners out there who are experiencing and, and going through their own uh, pain and, and financial hardship Sasha, you've been great and fantastic, a superb guest. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be sure to stay in touch. Want more entrepreneurial tips? Go to timlaskus.com.